Welcome to the Romancing Like Swift podcast, where we talk craft and the business of being an author while fangirling over Taylor Swift. We're your hosts, Morgana Bavin and Emily Jane. On this podcast, we'll discuss what authors can learn from Taylor Swift. There are many amazing Taylor Swift podcasts in existence. We know this. But our focus is on mining Taylor Swift's lyrics and business practices for tips to help our fellow authors excel in their careers. Today, we've got the incredible Becca Syme with us to chat through some of the things she's learned from and identified in Taylor Swift that could be helpful for authors. Hey, welcome to the podcast, Becca. Thank you for having me. On a side note, I have been talking with a friend of mine about doing an episode like this on the QuitCast. So this was like the (laughs) instigation of me having all the thoughts about it. So I'm so excited to talk about this. Yeah. I mean, I'm excited to talk to you because literally some of the things you said over the last three years have like set my mindset as an author. So having your perspective on what she's doing will be yeah. very fascinating. I'm excited. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't really need an introduction at this point, but why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, my primary work is in author alignment, right? So it's very much like, for those of you who don't know what I do, I coach individual authors, definitely, like that's a huge part of what I do. And I've coached more than 6,000 different individuals at this point in my career, which doesn't mean that I stand on a stage and talk to 6,000 people, although I'm sure I have. It means one-on-one individually, at least 45 minutes with 6,000 people. And one of my friends the other day was like, if people understood how much you know about this industry, I'm like, yeah, they would listen to me a lot more. Not that I don't think people listen to me, but it's more that the volume of what I see because of the high volume coaching situation the ability to see sort of big picture, like what's holding us back, what's happening in the industry, what are the big picture trends? Like, it's so easy for me to see because I coach at such a large volume, less now than I used to because I burned out a little bit. And I'll talk about that. But I feel like one of the things that I can do is speak to large trends and speak to sort of like, again, like I was talking about burnout in 2019 and 2018, (laughs) before we all had like sort of all experienced it at the same time, because I saw it coming. And so I think a lot of what I can do at coaching at volume is to see coming what's coming. So I try to talk about that as much as I can. I find it fascinating that you've burnt out. Oh, yeah. (laughs) It was because of your keynote speech at uh, Contemporary Romance Writers in, I don't know, 2021. He gave that speech, no, maybe 2022. Yeah, 2022. You gave that speech and it was like my brain pinged off and went, oh, that's what's wrong with me. Because I thought I had to burn out from the books. I didn't know I could burn out from everything else. Oh yeah, you can burn out. And that's the intro. I'm so glad you brought that up. Like you can burn out on just one thing, right? Like I could burn out on cooking meals. Like I can burn out from <laughs> laughing the decision because, fatigue yes. of just having to decide, you know, and that might be a small burnout or I could burn out on running Facebook ads because I'm not seeing progress anymore. And I'm putting a lot of work in, but I'm not seeing the return that I want to see. Or you can burn out on creativity and on writing, or you could do what I call like total burnout, which is when I described this in the burnout book, it was like, you can't even really get out of bed. Like you're just so completely, you have nothing left to give in any area, but like you could be burned out and still look really functional because you're not burned out on let's say your physical body's not burned out or like your ability to be around people is not burned out, but you're burned out on the business of authoring or so, you know, like you can burn out on really micro levels in addition to kind of the macro level too. I think it's the recovery stuff too. Like I come from a background in television where we were all used to working ourselves into the ground, doing ridiculous hours for every single show. So we'd go from contract to contract. We'd have like two weeks off and that'd be recovery time. 
And we would come back and think we've recovered. And now I'm dealing with recovery, like in the book space, like trying to be able to write like I used to be able to. And I'm realizing that all that time I never actually recovered, but I didn't have this like creative aspect that I was trying to push forward that I could notice it. So, yeah, it's like two massive holes, isn't it, in the industry where we're just used to driving ourselves into the ground. So I guess let's uh, pivot before we get lost in a burnout discussion. (laughs) (laughs) What have you, like, say you have lots of thoughts of what Taylor's doing. What would you say, like, you've learned from what she's doing? What do you see her doing that authors should be doing? Kind of the open-ended question of the whole podcast. When I think about what Taylor does well, like in terms of there's a lot of stuff that she's excellent at, right? And I'm sure we'll talk about more than just this. But one of the things that she is the best at is emotional regulation to a point where like, if you've been watching her since she was very young, she's always been able to do this on some level. Like it was clearly a skill that she either has a strength in this area and it's been maximized over time. But I think she's also done a significant amount of work. I don't know that she talks about it, but you can see the growth in her in a public arena to a point where even the language that she uses to talk about her process and how she works and the language she uses about her family, like she is able to be fully present and not be controlled by whether something works or not in the moment, like whether or not it appears that there's going to be an outcome that she favors in the moment. There's so much flexibility to her personality. And just a full disclosure, I'm less of a music listener of Taylor and more of a consuming of her as a person. Because when I first started watching interviews with her, I think it must have been around the Kanye moment, right? It was before the blow up. It was, you know, when, because I was fascinated with how she responded on stage to him. And I was watching live and I was like, wow, the presence of mind that it takes to respond that way on stage when millions of people are watching you and not It's not the practiced sort of PR stuff that comes afterwards, right? Because that's a team. That's a PR team. But I mean the way that you are physically composed around human beings when things don't go your way. And so she has fascinated me as a human being since that. And I have been, because again, my studying of people's brains, I'm like, I need to understand how that function happens because it's so, she just has so much presence of mind in the moment. And if you ever watch people when they don't get what they want, or when something happens that is not in their plan, or it's not their best option, right? You can almost see the frazzle happen in the very moment that it doesn't go their way. And that piece of just like, it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, it's going to be okay is really, and it's grown in her over time. But that is definitely the thing that I see in terms of what authors could learn for the future. I think that is the key number one capacity that she has that I think we could all learn from is the ability to self-regulate in the moment when things don't go the way we want them to go. Yeah, both in person and online. Mm-hmm. That is fascinating and not at all what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> like, I think it's a testament to like how smart you are and how you're always kind of like editing your opinions in real time or something. Yeah. I'm so fascinated. What did you think I was going to say? Because I do want to talk about her strengths as well, obviously, like for sure. Well, I heard you talk, and this is independent of me knowing the strength stuff, because I've done the whole strengths stuff and worked with a guy whose name I can't remember right now on your team. Oh, had a Terry. coaching, Yeah, coaching with Terry. Yeah. But I heard you talk at RAM in 2022, I think, about the whole like the trailblazer and the other types. I'm trying to remember what they the were. The right to market archetypes. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And I totally in my head, I thought you were going to come on and talk about her as a trailblazer, which she so clearly is, right? And how she uses that to sustain herself in this industry 
that probably takes a lot out of you, right? Like, so she's always reinventing herself. And I was like, and I didn't think about it at the time. I thought about, because I think I'm a trailblazer also. And I think that's that awareness of myself that I got from listening to you talk is like, oh, these are places I've gone wrong in my career. These are reasons why books didn't quite work or whatever. So I expected somehow to have some insight about that aspect of her but then this is like something new and fresh and unexpected. And, or I thought maybe you would talk about the whole, like building the career, you build the house you want to live in, build the house you want to live in. Yeah. 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 Those were the two things that I had in my head of the, like, this is probably content Becca's going to talk about in relationship to Taylor, but I think the emotional regulation is amazing and so spot on, right? Like she does this amazing job of always having a response to things that's not off the handle. That's not like. I can't imagine she doesn't have those emotional reactions at some point, but she does a really good job of keeping herself on message and on brand when she is in the public eye. Yes. And I want to, too, also say we can talk about both of those things in addition, (laughs) like because I do also, I totally agree with you about her as a trailblazer type, right? Like archetype. And then additionally, the build the house you want to live in thing. Somebody just pointed out to me recently, I think it must have been on TikTok when I was talking about it, that she had this whole segment of her interviews that she did about the house in the album and how it represented something. And I was like, oh, well, obviously, we're all seeing the same thing coming. And I think this might be part of why I latched on to the emotional regulation thing, because she is always ahead of the curve, speaking to her being a trailblazer, in terms of like, what do people need from her? Like, what do we all need to hear? Because what's coming for us is what we all need to hear. And When we were going to talk about Taylor's strengths, one of my conversations I have ongoing with my friend Claire, who does Enneagram work, is Taylor has an ability to be whatever it is that you need her to be for you in terms of like her ability to have a message that is translatable for you as an individual where she might not share that actual personality trait that you have, but she knows how to talk to you in a way that brings that out. So like the message in each of her songs has sort of a different individualization kind of, you know, track to it. And people who are very, very different are going to all feel like she is like them because they see something very specific in her that resonates with them. And she's able to speak in a very resonant language. I think she's the number one communication. If I had to guess, I would just guess that she was number one communication for that reason exactly. Because people who are trailblazers are going to hear her trailblazerness. People who are drafters are going to hear her drafterness. People who are evergreens are going to, you know what I mean? Like everybody's going to hear a little bit of themselves in her. She does combine all these things so expertly, right? Like I see the trailblazer, but she does have all these other elements that she sort of folds into her brand and her style and all this kind of stuff. It's amazing. But I didn't mean to cut you off, but then I did cut you off. Oh, no, no. Because I agree with you completely. (laughs) And I think that that ability to speak a lot of different emotional languages to a lot of different people is something that communication really excels at. I mean, it could come from other places, but but part of the reason I think that's so important is that I'm not surprised to hear her basically talking about sustainability because that's the building the house you want to live in kind of thing that I've been talking about a lot lately is the sustainability message. It is you can't just do these things over and over again and not expect that they're laying tracks down on some level. And so we need to be as conscious as possible about sustainability. And so that's the message that I think we're going to need in the next two to three years, which emotional regulation is a huge piece of that, like being able to stay emotionally regulated in the moment, no matter what happens to you or your career or your sense of self. Because I think that's a lot of what she has really come into in terms of her ability to regulate. She has come into a place where no matter what happens to her, she's going to be fine. 
And that's the piece that I think is really going to be important for us in the long term. And why I jumped probably two or three steps ahead is I think what we need over the next decade is going to be emotional regulation. And what we need over the next like two years is going to be kind of the sustainability stuff. So I'm absolutely not at all surprised when I heard somebody told me about the house on the album. I'm like, oh yeah, of course she's talking about sustainability because she's seeing where her fan base needs her help gaining some skills and she's modeling those skills for everyone. And really, I obviously have a lot of love for her (laughs) because I think what she does is really amazing. Yeah. And then in the like really like niche down basics of it, she said in the Miss America documentary, she thought she was set to retire. She didn't think she was going to have another wind. So I think a part of her setting down roots and that kind of part comes from a natural place of preparing herself. She's going to ride the train as far as she can go, but she's going to set herself up to be able to to step back when the time comes and not feel like she's lost her career to feel like it's a choice. And I think with her, everything has got to be a choice. 100%. Yeah. The piece of that discussion that I liked so much is that what I hear in her is that tumultuousness of that kind of the reputation era, I guess, right, is what Swifties call it, which is, I love that so much. But that tumultuousness of having to make the decisions to re-record all of her music and to kind of rebuild this house that she wants to live in, as she knows that the top of the top doesn't last forever. Everything is impermanent. Like every measure and level of success that you possibly could have in your lifetime is impermanent. It will never last. And I think she understands that at some point, because that's what I heard in that conversation, she knew that she was going to top out, right? She knew that what she had would not be sustainable for forever. She knew she had to build a house she didn't want to escape from because she needed that house to be able to last her entire life. And what we see with people like who rise to huge prominence and then end up kind of going down to the mid range of popularity again, I think of bands like Metallica or of people like Mariah Carey or Barbra Streisand, like you have sat on the top at a time. And then when you're not on the top anymore, you still want to be excellent. You still want to do excellent work and you still have a market of people, you know, are going to be with you forever. Those of us who are Metallica fans from the eighties are, and are still Metallica fans, but we may not see them at the top of the charts anymore because they're not the cool thing currently, but they know they're still going to be able to do excellent music and excellent work and do the thing for their fans that their fans want. And I feel like that's what Taylor kind of learned is that all of this is impermanent and you have to build something that you don't want to escape from in your career so that you can have it last for the rest of your life, whether you stay on top or not, whether you reach the top or not, whether you ever hit the level of success that you're dreaming about or not, you're going to have some success. And that success is going to be impermanent. So you need to set yourself up to have a life that has peace and stability and security in it that does not rely on anything other than you being peaceful and stable, which is what I heard her talking about, which is, again, that's why I think she took off because I think she came into this sense of security that was so seductive to us who don't have it, that we can see that in her and we want a piece of that. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, I do too. God, where do we go from there? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, but I feel like I do feel like some of this has to stem from her having such a supportive and rich family life and her parents, right? Like that relationship with her mom that she's not been shy about saying is so strong and that her mom is her, you know, like her companion on this journey and all this stuff. Some of that has to come from that, right? Because she has this base of stability there. Yeah. Yeah. When you mentally compare her to other child stars, you know what I'm saying? Like she's got so much more because she started 13, 
How old yeah, was she? Yeah, 12 she or 13, just, I think. Yeah. Yeah, which is really young. But she has managed to, you know, the thing that they say about celebrities, which is like your emotional age is always the age at which you hit your celebrityness, right? Your stardom. And that does not seem to be true for her. I feel like. I feel like. She said in the documentary that until everything went down with before reputation, where she moved herself from public life, she was fixed at the age at which she became famous. She was still a teenager, even though she was in her 20s. She was still a teenager. And that year where she stepped away, she did a lot of her own growth. So I think that's the drastic changes come in is that she's taken the space. She didn't want to take, but she took space and learned about herself and figured out what she had to change. Yeah, I feel like the level of tumult that she went through either produces, like it cracks you, right? Either it destroys you or it makes you better. And I think she's one of the people who gets made better by that level of pressure. And I see this in a lot of musicians and actors who I think continue to progress in their emotional state as they go through their career. And it absolutely is less common, but there definitely are other people who do this. And to Emily's point, I think what I see in her is there's a foundational relationship of some kind. And so for those of you who are listening, who don't have parents who have that kind of relationship with you, it can be another person, but there has to be some kind of a foundational security and relationship where you know that there's someone or, yeah, I would say a group of people potentially, or a person or people who are always going to think well of you no matter what, so that you can have a place to process and be vulnerable and have that level of support interpersonally, whether it's your family or not, you know, but in her case, for sure, it's obviously it's her mother and her parents. But what I think is so cool about that concept is I think so many of us we get this sense from the larger culture that we're supposed to do everything on our own, that there's some kind of merit in being on our own. But what we see in people who are actually on their own and are doing everything themselves is that it doesn't last. Like that ability to produce only lasts as long as your own personal energy penny bank will last you. And for a lot of us, that's not very long. But when you have these places, these either, you know, foundational, like familial relationships or foundational friendships or groups, you have the ability to retreat into those and gain support from those people. But then also, like, Because I think there's a couple of things that are really important in those foundational relationships. They can't just be blanket approval relationships. What I don't mean is that you have someone who will always just tell you you're doing a great job and you're fine and there's nothing wrong with you. What I mean is you have a place to retreat and be yourself. So if you're struggling, you have someone who's going to help you find the support that you need, the therapy, the coaching, the management, whatever it is. If you need to delegate, somebody's going to say, hey, maybe you need a housekeeper or hey, maybe you need a house cleaner or maybe you need to hire a like childcare professional. Maybe you need an assistant, like those kinds of things where the person is going to speak some truth to you. So it can't just be like, I rah, rah, I think you're great. You're amazing. It also needs to be somebody who's going to push you. And just on a personal note, because I have an athletics background and my family's in athletics, I do a lot of watching of athletes, like really top tier athletes, like the Venus Williams level, Michael Phelps level athletes. And I do, I listen and watch a lot of interviews in them. And one of the things I think athletes get and super high level musicians get that a lot of authors don't understand is you need somebody to push you. Like if you're going to be at that high level, you need someone who will, yes, be a soft place to land, but you need somebody who's going to be like, don't phone that in, you know, don't work yourself to the bone, take a week off. Don't try to do it all yourself. Hire a house cleaner, you know, don't take the easy route. Don't cheat on that thing. 
do the hard work. Like you need people who both are going to support and be kind and accepting and also people who are going to push and not let you be, if you, again, if you want to attain high levels of excellence, not let you be rest on your laurels person. Yeah. You don't need a yes man, basically. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But support is huge. Like support foundational relational support, I think is a huge thing that we could learn from, from her for sure. I was trying to figure out who mine is. And I think it's my editor. I was going to say the person who pushes you is something I always talk about with editing in particular, but I think it does. I'm realizing that it applies across the board, but I have always said, I never want to be so successful that my editors stop editing me right? That they just bow to what I've written because obviously that has, I've not reached that point in my career. Maybe I should have put a different energy out into my, (laughs) back in the early days and said, you know, I want to be that successful, but I don't want them to. Because I do think there are authors who stop getting sound editorial from the people, you know, from whoever is editing them. And you can see that. And it's like, And it's not just authors. It's also filmmakers or, you know, like I see it a lot in filmmakers, right? You know, like, oh, you've got this level of success and now people have stopped questioning whether or not everything you do is good. And then all of a sudden that goes away because you've stopped producing good work. But Which I guess is a good segue into the golden age where you talk about the golden age. And for me, looking at how Taylor's handling her re-recordings, I mean, I'm desperate for reputation, but... At the same time, I recognize the pattern and where albums need space to breathe. Do you find like, I don't know how we relate this to authors, but the fact that she is taking her time and not rushing something. Yes. I'm so glad we're talking about this just because personally, I think there's a big reckoning coming in the industry about the way that we have been forming product for the market based on the rules of the gold rush, right? And what I don't mean is that every single person out there is putting out a crappy product because I actually think that there are people who are capable of writing a book very fast and having it be excellent. So that is a possibility. And if you are that person, you can stop listening to me because like the script for Rocky was written in three hours and it's one of the best scripts of all time. And it was written in three hours. So you know that it's possible to write something excellent and fast. But what we've gotten into because of the gold rush is that fast was the primary dominating factor about whether or not we would put a book out. Can I get them out fast enough? Can I produce enough books in a year in order to be able to keep my income at the place that it's at? And unfortunately, we don't have the problem of open blue water anymore. So when the problem of the industry was that there weren't enough books in the market that could be read, that were of a passable quality that could be read and enjoyed by readers. The famous sort of example is that it's 70% good, right? 70% is better than 100 because you can do 70 faster. Like that, I can't tell you how many times I heard that advice between 2011 and 20, well, today. I still hear it today. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not true anymore. Because in 2011 and before, New York intentionally kept the market unsaturated. They intentionally released fewer books per year than they knew readers needed in terms of like the per genre, right? Like how many contemporary romances can a contemporary romance reader read in a year? They would release fewer than that because they knew that it was better for the market to create scarcity and to need to force people to choose what they had, right? So once we took the scarcity problem away, because the indie gold rush made all the walls go down, excellent, 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 so glad that it happened. But now the problem that the readers have is that they have too many books to choose from. So then the metrics change in terms of how are they going to make those choices? And we have to have a 
real hard conversation about how readers are making choices when they just have too many good books to choose from. They're now either choosing to go to Book Talk as a curator because someone, thank God, will help them wade through the slush pile, right? Like that's essentially what they're using Book Talk as right now. Or they're using suggestion engines, like either authors suggesting books to them that they like, like author newsletters, or they're using BookBub or something similar, right? But the problem that we now have is that the market is so saturated that readers need help figuring out how to choose which books to read. So they're seeking out places to help them figure this out. And if you are not currently able to write a book that people will talk about, it is much, much, much harder to sell. And I know this is going to trigger some of us, because we have a quality orientation desire. And I'm just going to tell you the people who are that worried that they're not able to produce a quality book are not the people that I'm talking to. Like it generally is the people who are, if you're worried about whether you can produce a quality book or not, you're going to keep getting better and better and better. But then I need for those of us who have that quality orientation to hear me We do have to work on that now. We have to work on our craft more. We have to work on our pacing more. We have to work on the ability to write better hooks and write, you know, be more emotionally resonant, et cetera. Because yeah, the problem that the readers have, which is saturation, is going to get solved by somebody. And if we want it to be us, we have to be able to write something that is such a good story that they're going to talk about it enough that we can make it over. And I don't mean just for TikTok cuz TikTok is, you know, book talk is not making everybody's choices, but something is cuz the slush pile is and again, I'm not saying all the books that are released are crappy. In fact, I do think we have a problem of having a lot of good books in the industry right now. It's not I'm not a person who would say, well there's just millions and millions of junk books out there. I think part of the problem is we have a high number of pretty good books that are in the industry, but they're not getting found. And so the curation engine needs to be the problem solved. So yeah, I don't know that that's going to make anybody feel real great for me to talk about that because it's a problem that we can't solve, but it's definitely the problem that readers are having. It definitely makes me feel better about all of the pre-orders I've delayed in the last year. (laughs) because I've hit that point on multiple books where I'm just like, it's not good enough. (laughs) I can't do it. It's not good enough. I'm trying not to feel it right now because uh, I can't delay this pre-order another month. Amazon won't let me. So it's, yeah, it's a painful thing when we are like stuck in this cycle of have to have a pre-order up. You can't release a book without a pre-order. I'm wide. So everything is. Oh, yeah. You can't release a book without a pre-order in the back of the book. If you do that, the series dies. And I have personal experience of this happening to me that I'm terrified of it. But I was talking to friends and I'm like, what I really, really want is just to write what appears to be a standalone. It connects to a character I've already set up in other books and write lots of these appears to be standalones with no pressure on when they have to release. And then when they're all done then I'll connect them in a series. But that's not the (laughs) wide way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So let me say something about too about that in terms of like the Pirates of the Caribbean line of like, there's what a man can do and what a man can't do. Right. And I always think of that in terms of like, I feel like a lot of us get caught in the dilemma sometimes of trying to make the decisions of like what we want based on this outcome that we want to happen, right? Which is, I want to be able to make a living writing with my books. Like I want to be able to make a sustainable living writing with my books. And I think most of us have that desire. Not everybody, not everyone does. But if you have that desire and you're making that happen, there's a possibility that at some point in the future, you're going to have to choose between doing what's best for me and doing the thing that will make my career continue, right? And I'm definitely not singling you out about this. I just think this is something that we're learning from that moment that Taylor had about like, I may not be able to do this 
right? Like I may not be able to keep this up. And I think there are a lot of us who are going to hit those moments in our author career at some point in the future. All who are hearing this, who are going to hit those moments, you can ignore me now and call me delusional now. But when you hit this moment in the future, I want you to remember this and come back and listen to this podcast episode, because I'm going to tell you what the answer is. And it is what Taylor did. You have to release the expectation that this is going to last forever and do the thing that's the best for you to do. And again, I'm not singling Morgana out because you may not want to do that right now and that's okay. But at some point, if you can't continue to live in the house that you've built, right, in terms of like, I have a wide platform, I have a bunch of pre-orders in order for me to keep making a living as an author, I have to do it this way then at some point you may have to get caught in that dilemma of like what a woman can do and what a woman can't do. And I may not be able to sustain this life that I've created for myself. And I think some of us are going to hit that spot in the next three years of like, I cannot continue to do it this way. And you're going to hit the reputation era, right? Of some of us are going to have to make decisions between things that we really do not want to happen, but life is going to force us into that place. And again, I'm not suggesting anyone takes my advice here, but I am saying save this episode for the future because an awful lot of us are going to, and I hate saying this in terms of like, it feels like I'm doom saying a little bit, right? But I just see it coming, like the combination of things out of our control, the level of saturation, the speed of the industry, and saturation is not slowing down. Because even if people aren't currently being bad actors about AI, at some point, there will be people who are using AI in ways that are not ethical in the industry. And it's going to affect some of us and the way that we make our living. And I don't say that to make anybody scared. I say it to say, There's no use in adapting to something that hasn't happened yet, but I do see that there are days coming when some of us are going to need to make choices we don't want to think about making, and we need to remember that that emotional regulation, that feeling of knowing that I will be okay no matter what happens, is the most important skill that we can possibly have, and it is the key to sustainability in this career in terms of like, if you want an author for life career, you want to be an author for your lifetime, we have to be able to regulate ourselves in the midst of things going absolutely wrong and the way we don't want them to go. But I say all that to say that wasn't an answer to your specific, what should I do? It more just reminded me like, why did I bring up emotional regulation? in the first place. And it's because I see this moment of reckoning coming for a lot of us where we are building houses we can't live in, but we don't want to admit that that's what we're doing because it's just what we have to do right now. But we're terrified is the right word. We have to be able to increase our emotional regulation skills so that if something does happen where I cannot make the pre-order or I cannot make the payment, or I have to go get a part-time job, or I have to, you know, slow down my publishing schedule or whatever it is that we're going to have to make the decision about that. We know we're still going to be okay. And you can still have an author career for your lifetime. Even if you stop making a full-time living today, you can still be an author for the rest of your life. So hilariously that some of those are things that I've reckoned with in the last like month. (laughs) I would imagine. Yeah. (laughs) Slowing down schedules. Yep. Been through that. Hate it. Deal with it. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I've been in this industry long enough, but yeah, I mean, like there was a period prior to COVID and the sort of like 20, I think it was about 2015 to 2018 period where I had to step back because, you know, I was writing for Harlequin Silhouette and I had pushed myself so hard to hit those that kind of book over and over again. And there were things that were, you know, when I first sold, trad was it. There was no indie at all. And it was, you know, so with Harlequin, you're fitting yourself into a very specific niche and there's not a lot of room. If it rubs you the wrong way, there's not a lot of room to deviate, right? And so I feel like I did, I hit that wall where I just, 
I did not have another billionaire book in me. I did not have, except for Silhouette Desire, I did not have another book like that that I could produce. And, you know, with Harlequin, when you hit 25, they make a big deal out of you and they give you like a pin and there's a whole thing. And I think I stopped at like 23. And I remember someone who was like, can't you just write two more to get to 25 and get the pin and get the whatever? And I was like, I cannot. (laughs) I do not have two more of those books in me. I barely had the last one in me. And yeah, you do. You just, you hit a wall and you cannot make yourself go forward. And it wasn't only the books, there were other things in my life that were part of it, but it really was, a lot of it was that like, I so wanted to be a Harlequin author until I was a Harlequin author and having to do that over and over again. I mean, I grew up reading category romance. That's what I loved. But again, that trailblazer in me really chafed the Harlequin box, really chafed the trailblazer in me. Yeah. And ultimately, there are things about ourselves we can't change. You know, like there are things that I'm going to be a happier person if I am true to myself for the rest of my life, because I can't escape myself for the rest of my life. I'm going to be with me forever. And the more I betray me, the more likely I am to not be happy in my skin and my life. I want to highlight something you said too, because I feel like there was this moment with Taylor where she just decided whatever happens, happens. Right. And it sounds like from some of her interviews that it was when she pulled back from the public space that she just had this kind of reckoning with herself about like, I can chase these things, I can want this, but ultimately there are things I can't control and whatever happens, happens. And I think of that reckoning moment as like, it's going to come for all of us at some point, no matter who we are and no matter where we are, we're going to have to reckon with this. There are things I can't change and whatever happens, happens. And the peace and stability that she gained after that, like the ability that she has on stage, like when you watch, if you got to see her in person, I still wish that I had gone to see this when it was in my city, but I've watched it on big screen now, of course, because thank you for that opportunity. But the ability to be so fully present in the moment that no matter what happens to you, whether or, you know, things going wrong on a concert that you've paid, you know, maybe millions of dollars to produce and things are going wrong and you are the person who's in charge of it and you need to be, you know, you know, you're going to be held to account. And still there's this presence of mind of like, None of that matters. None of whatever it is that happens matters because we're all here together. And there's this relational connection that was produced by going through the fire, right? That level of presence of mind was produced by awful turmoil and difficulty and coming out the other side, knowing that no matter what happens, we're going to be fine. Like we're going to be okay. Well, and I think the bond she has with her fans speaks to that also, because it is very much a, we did this together, right? Like, I remember that because I did, I'm so thankful I did see her in concert and that there is this moment where she talks about like, like, this is what we've done together. Like, I'm here because you're here and you're here because I'm here. And this is us as a, almost as a family, as a unit that made it through this. Yeah. She does that so well, right? The connection is... I think she probably expected to come out of that year hiding to find there was nothing left. That that it all been burnt to the ground and there were no fans left. But she found fans. Everybody was waiting for her. And that's the thing, is she's seen that no matter what she does, she has that core group of fans that are always going to support her. Well, and Morgana, you and I have talked a lot about how one of the ways she connects so much with fans is that she is every woman, right? She is, her experience is an intrinsic female experience. And that, you know, Becca, you were just saying, we all have that moment of reckoning, right? And so she is sort of our spirit guide. And when that comes for us, when that moment comes for us, we can look to her to, how did she step through it, right? Oh, yeah. Like, I think people like Taylor 
And I see this happen in in other musician, like fan circles as well. I've seen it happen with Lady Gaga. I've seen it happen with Beyonce. Like I've seen it happen with several different performers and their core fan groups where there is an element of a religious experience of belonging to a group that is so tightly identified. And so, and you almost feel like, there's a validation of who you are that's intrinsic to the core of who that performer is or who that leader is or who that, you know, whatever. Like there is this element of like, it's us against everyone or I belong here and I'm okay. And because we have such a fundamental need to be validated and to belong on that really fundamental level there is a very spiritual or religious experience in belonging to a group of people like a lot of Swifties feel very self-identified with her, right? Like this is why I was sort of, I joke with Claire about this because we've been talking about doing a podcast about Taylor's Enneagram and her strengths. And I was like, I mean, I'm going to tell people what I think her strengths are objectively and nobody's going to agree with me because they're all going to see their own strengths in her because there's some level of self-identification with the emotion of her son. I see the same thing with Beyonce and I've seen the same thing with Lady Gaga, especially like those three are probably the three performers I see it the most in, in terms of like, there's something about that person that you identify so strongly with their experience that on some level you see yourself in them. And I think that's essentially what religion does is it unifies us with a sense of belonging and a sense of purpose. And I see a lot of that spiritual affirmation, I think, in a lot of performers these days where they are creating almost like mini I hesitate to use the word cult because I don't think it's a cult. I don't think any of the three of those performers are cult, but I do think there's like a mini identification that happens where I see myself in her and that means I'm okay because she's okay. And I just don't know that we all collectively realize how much we have that need for belonging because so many of us, again, like, we identify so much with the individual, you know, sort of bootstrapping American dream style, which I don't understand. I did not grow up ever identifying with that. So I don't understand that. In fact, I feel like I, on some level, I'm a number two connectedness. And I grew up in this little pocket of the country right on the Canadian border, where it was like everything just, I grew up on a road where it was only my family, like on the whole road was just me And then one after another of like my great aunt, my grandparents, my cousin, my uncle, my great aunt, like all the way down the road. It was just our family on that little section. And weirdly, I have two other friends who grew up in the same town in different pockets. And they had the exact same experience where it was like this little mini kind of almost conclave of our families. And everything belonged to everybody. Like there was an interdependence that was assumed in your existence that like we were all just for context. I grew up about 30 miles from the town that is the farthest from a Starbucks in the continental United States. (laughs) So like I grew up in a very, very remote, you know, part of the country where there was not a lot, there was no center where everyone could gather and get all their needs met themselves, right? Like we were essentially a family that had to rely on each other. And so I grew up in a much more interdependent kind of experience than I think your average American grows up in. So I never understood this, like I have to do everything myself Everyone has to rely on me and I can't rely on anyone. I don't get that connectedness. But it goes against the fabric of what a lot of us would identify with in terms of our businesses. Like it needs to be about me. I need to do this myself, etc. That need for belonging goes against a lot of that grain. And so I don't think we self-identify enough just how much we need to belong to something. But it is such a fundamental whole in our psyche, if it's not being met. 
And I think so much of what someone like Taylor or Beyonce can provide for their fans is that feeling of like, I belong to something. I see myself in a person who needs me also, right? Because the performers need their fans to show up. The performers need their fans to sing, to buy their albums. And then the fans need the performers to be connected to them and to find them to be important, right? So there's this kind of symbiotic connection. But yeah, I don't know why I got off on this, but it's one of the most fascinating parts of what I think humans don't realize about us is that we all do actually need that. And a lot of you who are like, I hate people are going to say that, you know, the misanthropes are like, I don't need that because I hate people. And I'm like, oh, no, you do. You just identify with a group that might be leaderless, there might be a friend group or you know whatever but we all need that knowing that we belong to something and i think she provides that really really well for her fans how do we do that for our own for our readers there's always the direct translation like our readers we need them to show up so we are in a sense that figure for a certain group of readers that's been part of the podcast trying to figure out how we grow that and how we nurture it yeah how we create the super fans. Yeah, how do you make super fans? So the core premise of what I'm about to talk about is an archetypes continuum similar to what Emily had referenced before about the trailblazers. But there's a continuum of behavior where some of us really need to be that person who organizes people around us, right? And some of us really need to create a world that does that for us instead of like us being the person. And then some of us don't need either of those things because essentially all we want to do is just not be a physical presence in our community. Like we don't want to create, we don't want Swifties, right? Like we don't want the equivalent of that, but we also don't want Marvel. So we don't want to create a world where everybody, or we can't. So I think of those as like three separate categories of platforms. And if you're the type of person who really identifies with being a public figure and you're okay with people organizing themselves around you, there's a book that I want you to read and it's called Monster Loyalty. And it's about the Lady Gaga fan phenomenon. I'm sure that at some point people could write a Beyonce version and a Taylor version of that book as well. But she specifically, the person is a researcher and she specifically picked Lady Gaga because I do think that the identification of belonging is a really important piece. And she goes into how to create that. But the problem is that most of us who are that style of person where I call it the superstar platform, where you're going to organize people around you and there's some quality of you that they're going to belong to versus the sandbox platform, which is the world, like the Marvel thing, right? Nobody is identifying with the creator of Marvel. They're identifying with the Avengers, right? They want to play around in the sandbox of the Avengers. And so that's a sandbox platform, but the superstar platform in particular, I think people who want that focus too broadly, Like they try too much to think about somebody like Taylor as a model where you can have people who are so different and so completely unconnected to each other and have completely different backgrounds and really no interests in common other than what Emily mentioned in terms of like the every woman experience, right? If you happen to have the same experiences that she had with her interpersonal relationships, you're going to really identify with her music. And then if you didn't, you find somebody else to identify with. But even that is too broad of a scope for most of us. And what this book focuses on is there is a 1% of your own fandom that represents exactly what the core of your message is about you if you're a superstar platform person. And you need to figure out what that is. And Lady Gaga figured out what it was and she identified it and gave it a name and gave them an identity and they belong to a group where they very specifically identify as little monsters and they are separate from everyone else, right? They identify as that. And then what happens is that group appeals to the rest of the 100% of people who are your fans but it really is that core identity of something that is that stands out, right? 
So when you have a superstar style platform where you're going to be the center of the platform, it is really key that you do as much studying as you can of what you provide to this group of readers that is separate from what they can get in other places and that you focus your kind of loyalty around that. So like the Savannah Bananas Fans First book is another good one for that, where he talks about providing an unreplicable experience, something that no one else they get from you that they can't get from anyone else. But that's the kind of thing that I think is going to help us in as we move into the future. And we know we're going to have to collect readers in some way. And either we're going to collect them where we provide the same story for them all the time, like the sort of laboratory version, or we provide something about us that they really identify with that we build that around, or we create the sandbox world, that there's something about that world they want to play in. And of course, In each one of those silos, there's a level of excellence that you have to reach at that in order to really be able to have success in the long run. And so the key for me is understanding which of those you're better at and then trying to get the most out of, you know, is it me? Is it the world? Or is it the content itself, right? Is it just, they just want, a hundred thousand dragon shifter romances from me and I can do that. Then go ahead and do the laboratory or the, I think there were two, oh, the spawns in the laboratories. Cause anyway, I won't get into that. We're going to talk about that at my digital conference this year. But for me, the superstars is kind of what like a Taylor or a Beyonce would provide where there's something about them. There's a quality you identify with about them that is almost aspirational on some level, that it's either their attitude, their self-possession, their peace and security, their self-acceptance. There's something about them that you want to be like on some level. And so that identification is part of what keeps you in that group. I literally feel like I could go on about this for hours and hours, but that's kind of the fundamental baseline for me. That one quality is we focus too much on the hundred percent and not enough on the one percent that is like the cream at the top. Like the Ruby Dixon books are the sandbox, right? Because like she's created this whole ice planet barbarian world. Yeah. Yeah. On some level, something like Akatar, right, would be a sandbox, Marvel, you know, there's a lot of sandbox worlds out there. Some are bigger than others. And like, I have a client who has a sandbox platform who no one would know what her name is because she's not like on the Sarah Moss level, but her fans are so rabid about this world. Like they have their own discord. They do sort of fan fiction about her stuff. They have their own little mini conference that they do every year. She is the progenitor of that world for them, right? So she's important to them, but it really is the world that they're playing around and that they want more of. And I have several clients who have platforms like that, but then it just becomes sort of figuring out which one you are the best at. And again, this is part of the learning curve of this industry. And I know I say this a lot, but you can't always know this from minute one. Like you don't know whether you are a superstar, a sandbox, or a spawn. You don't know that. But you know after a few years, or maybe several books, or maybe a couple of series. And so, so many of us are trying so hard to get out of the research and development phase of business growth, that we are not aware that if you spend more time really getting to know who you are and what you are in your R&D phase, you're going to have a lot more success when you get into the other phases of your business growth, because you're going to have an easier time talking about what you provide and branding yourself. And what I don't mean is that everyone is has to find the one thing they're going to write for the rest of their lives, because that's not everyone's type of business, right? But what I do mean is, When you get far enough into a career, a couple of years sometimes is all it takes for people. You can look back and see, oh, I'm providing a sandbox for them. I'm not providing a superstar. Like, in fact, when I first started talking about this, the people at our first digital con where I mentioned this were like, oh, so you're this two platform, you're the superstar. And I was like, nope, I have a sandbox platform. 
And the way you know that is people don't talk about me, they talk about strengths and archetypes. They don't identify with me as a person. They like me. They like what I have to say. And I even see this in my content. The content that I make that is about something besides strengths or archetypes is crickets. Because what they want, they know that what I provide is that framework and structure of how to understand my author's success. And that's the sandbox they're playing in, right? So when I made that shift away from like, oh, I don't think I can be, because I don't want to be known. I don't want to be a superstar. I don't want to have people who like get my name tattooed on their body. That sounds disgusting to me. And again, like not that I would judge anybody if they did that, but that does not sound good to me. But if everyone in the world knew what strengths were, my job would be done, right? I have dreams about that moment. That to me is like, I want to build the focus of my career around people knowing that there's nothing wrong with them just because they're different from other people. And that the framework of them understanding that there's security to be had and knowing you don't have to be like somebody else, that you can be you and still have success and not have to worry about whether you're fitting into the mold correctly, right? Like that for me is the sandbox platform. And when I figured that out about myself, it changed everything about how I organized my business. And that took me, I've been doing this for a decade right? It took me 10 years to figure that out and to organize around it. So it's not like if I haven't done this yet, I can't. It's that when you have a reckoning, and it might be burnout that causes it, it might be the industry that causes it. But when you have a reckoning of some kind, you have to be willing to go to use the Star Wars metaphor, right? You have to be willing to go into the cave and face Vader and see that Vader is you, (laughs) and then come out and be at peace and let yourself, you know, go into your next era, I guess, on some level to put it in Swifty language. (laughs) (laughs) So the last thing I wanted to like circle back to is the burnout end of things. So we can see Taylor going hard at it. She's touring nonstop. She's re-recording. She's recording. She's doing music videos. She's flying back and forth across the frigging world. To me, that's a recipe for burnout. And we know she has tactics that she's like talked about, the no alcohol rule, her preparation before she went on tour. I still feel like it's a recipe for burnout. So I'm kind of like, do you think she has tactics in place to prevent burnout? And are there any of those pieces that we can dissociate to ourselves to stop what's coming? Yeah. So my answers to questions like this are always, it depends, right? Because with the right motivation and the right behind the scenes work, I think running really, really hot with your engine like that is totally possible. But you have to be willing to give up every single piece of control that you don't actually need to have to maintain the quality, right? So what I see in her is the size of her team. And the things that she trusts them with is significant, right? Like she is not trying to cook her own meals. She is not trying to do her own house cleaning. Like she has recognized what her time is worth to her business. And she has decided, I'm not going to do any of the rest of that stuff. And yes, I can hear some of you thinking, I don't think it's the two of you, but I can hear some of the people listening thinking, well, it'd be nice if I made a billion dollars, I could do that too. And I'm like, I don't actually make very much money. Like when it comes down to it, I don't make very much money personally. And I still choose to have both an in-house personal assistant and also a house cleaner because The time that I get back from them is worth the investment to my business and to my life because my individual time can't just be working all the time. And I think this is part of the way to sustainability is that what I used to do, right, is like, well, if I assume that I have to do so many hours of house cleaning and so many hours of cooking and so many hours of errands and so many hours, then what I have left over is what I give to the business. And it's like, why am I doing that? Because if I budget my time and energy correctly and my money correctly, 
then I can get more out of my time if I'm willing to turn over the stuff I don't actually have to do. And I hear so much resistance to that because of finances. And I think people think that, first of all, that that kind of help is so much more expensive than it is. That's the first thing I think that people think. But the second piece is that if you're going to do that, you're going to wear yourself out eventually. And this is the burnout that I think a lot of us are experiencing that we don't realize is we are actually doing too much for the time that we have. We're expecting too much from ourselves and then we're getting frustrated when we're not seeing the results that we want. And so we work harder and then we rest less and et cetera. So I do think that what I see in Taylor is what is only the stuff that I absolutely need to do and how do I bring people around me to support me and build towards a place where that becomes my goal. My goal becomes I want to do as little as humanly possible of the stuff that I don't absolutely need to be doing so that I can do things that matter more with my time. And we joke about this because I do this ROI calculation in my head constantly. I'm like, what is the return on investment of me taking a weekend off? It's massive. Because my return on investment is I get my energy back, I feel rested, I feel, and is it worth the, like, let's just say, is it worth the $200 that I'm going to get back from, like, having someone else clean my house for a day instead of me doing it? Yep, 100%. It is absolutely worth it to me because that's $200 I'm investing in my future of not burning out. So if I have to go around in my budget and do something to make that happen, then that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not a person who says, no matter what, you should have this. I do recognize that there's an advantage to making money that I can't get around. So I apologize to the people who are like, I genuinely can't afford $200 a month. Then I'm not being as empathetic to that place because I would have to coach that individual person to know, like, is there something else that we could do? Could you be asking for other people to help you in other ways? Could you be doing less? But I feel like so many of us just do everything and don't ever question whether we should or not. And we don't think about getting support in areas where it'll really help, or we're paying for support from people who aren't actually supporting us because we don't want to fire them. And the number of people that I know who are paying for help and not getting help because they are loath to fire a person because they now have a relationship with them is really significant. And if you are that person, you need to come coach with us so that we can help you get past that because that is a thing that needs to happen. We can't expect that the people we're paying who are not helping us are just magically going to gain the capacity to help us. They're usually the wrong fit and we need to just let them go. But anyway, I get off on these tangents because I'm thinking of all the people that I coach who have these same objections, right? When I say like, okay, you need to get help. And they're like, well, I hired somebody and they didn't work out. And I'm like, then you hired the wrong person, hire somebody else, right? Like I'm just, I'm not going to accept it didn't work out as an answer. Like I'm going to keep pushing until I find the thing that makes the difference because I'm not going to assume that it'll happen again just because it happened once, right? Or twice or three times. Like I'm going to figure out what to change and keep going, but that's my personality. So I want to acknowledge too, for the people who are like, I couldn't do what Taylor does. Yeah. Most of us couldn't, almost none of us could run at that level of heat because we wouldn't be able to offload the things that need offloading. Even if we had the money, we would still want to cook the meals for our own family, right? We would still want to do our own whatever. Like, I still want to drive my kids to school. I still want to, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, okay, well, you can do that. But then we have to change other expectations. And the biggest question that I have for people who are looking at someone like Taylor as like a template for themselves is, do you value what she values? Because it's super clear 
that she values her fans so much that she wants to give this experience to absolutely everybody. And she values her own product enough that she wants the product to be as excellent as it can possibly be. And that level of value creates energy in her that allows her to do more than maybe somebody who didn't have that same value set would have. So I also would go back to, do I think it would be sustainable for absolutely anyone? Absolutely not. Nope. Most people don't have that set of values. But do I think it's sustainable for her? Yeah. Because I think that it will be over. Like this level of push will be over at some point and then she will take a rest and then she'll do something else, right? But this level, I think she has a great support team. She's handing off everything she doesn't absolutely need to be doing. And she's setting rules that will help her be sustainable. And then she knows that it's going to end. Like, I do think those four things are all very, very important. All I just heard is permission to not feel guilty for eating out every night. (laughs) Yep, 100%. 100%. So basically, I'm going to stop looking for places with kitchens because it just stresses me out. (laughs) Yes, that is maybe the biggest indicator that you shouldn't be doing it is when you know it's stressful. And then I would say, okay, what's the expectation I have in my head that somehow it's bad for me to eat out? Like somehow it's either not worth it or it's bad for me. Like then I want to start questioning the premise of that assumption rather than stressing myself out extra. And this is what I meant about things like housework and driving my kids and, you know, et cetera, is a lot of us have these expectations. We just never question them. We're like, well, of course I have to be the person that drops my kids off at school. And I'm like, do you? Like, is that a value you have where I want to spend the extra time with my children and it's not worth it for me to work those extra hours? Or are you doing it because you think you have to? Because if you're doing it because you think you have to, you do not have to do anything except not murder people and like not take advantage of people. Like those are the only requirements for being human is like be a decent human being to other people. Otherwise, there's nothing you have to do. You don't have to do your own housework. You don't have to cook your own meals. You don't have to not eat out. You don't have to work. You don't have to travel. You don't have to not travel. You don't have to see people. Like all these things we think we have to do are all based in just repeated expectations in our head. And so many of them are not built on anything we actually value. They're built on things that we're afraid if we don't do it, something bad is going to happen. Like people are going to judge me. There are people who are going to judge me for not cleaning my own house. Those are not people I want to be associated with. (laughs) Like you guys can go judge people who don't clean their own house in someone else's life because I know that my time will be more valuable to myself, my future self, my business, and all the people who are connected to me if I spend time writing content and resting and reading instead of cleaning. So I'm just not going to care what those people think. But again, that was a lot of questioning the premise and a lot of, you know, deconstructing like things that I expected of myself that were not formed in any reasonable set of logic. (laughs) So we do have sort of baggage from our childhood or our whatever that ties a moral issue to certain behaviors, right? Like, and deconstructing that questioning the premise And saying, like, there is no moral value to cooking dinner for your family, right? If you enjoy it, do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you can't afford to, then, yeah, there's me saying there's no moral value. That comes from a place of privilege. But aside from that, take that element out of it and say, like, me cooking dinner for my family does not make me a better person. It is something I choose to do. If I am choosing to do it because I love doing it, that's great. But I shouldn't be resenting it. And doing it the whole time thinking, well, I could be writing. I would rather be writing. I would rather be doing something else. Yeah. So pull that element up. Whatever voice in your head is judging you and attaching some moral value to something, you can pull that out and then say, okay, what am I left with? What do I choose to do? How do I choose to spend my time? That was a little bit of a tangent. (laughs) No, I agree with you. A thing I have been working on. (laughs) 
Yeah, I totally agree. And I think there's an element of, for me, I always like knowing why those things were helpful. Because if I'm going to be expected to do that, which I think maybe a hundred years ago, that would have been an expectation of somebody like me that I would have been expected to do that. Then I want all of the voices in my head to line up in terms of like, yeah, then if that's my job and that's the thing that I choose to do, then yeah, I should want to do that. I should feel compelled to do that. It's a survival instinct, right? But we so often are conflating survival instincts with things that are not actually survival anymore. So if it's a survival thing for you, absolutely, I think I wouldn't question that feeling. Or if you do actually love doing it, I wouldn't question that feeling. But when you're hitting the place where you know it's stressing you out and you feel like there's an element of maybe I could just not do this, I would try not doing it. Because so often the thing that we think is only we think it ahead of time, like the thing we're afraid of. But once we see that you can actually do it and be okay, then you start teaching yourself, oh, I can do this and be okay. Like I may have been, this isn't true for me because my mom also has a housekeeper, a house cleaner. So I didn't have this. But if somebody was like, oh, I'm going to feel so judged if I get a house cleaner for the first time try doing it and see what happens. See if you feel better afterwards or if you really do feel judged. Because so often the thing we're afraid of in our head is actually just garbage information that we're not actually going to feel that way later. We just are afraid that we might. So try the thing and see what happens. See if you feel better or if you feel judged. And if you still don't like it after you try it, then don't do it again. But hey, you might realize that your brain's just feeding you garbage information and that it's actually okay for you to do the thing you didn't think you would be okay doing. Yep. Boy, we went all the way there this time. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh. Right. Should we wrap it up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing like deep thoughts with Becca for like it, the Monday morning. It's what morning. I rely on you for, honestly. <laughs> yeah. You and Joe Solari, I rely on both of you to scare the crap out of me so I get my act together and change things. <laughs> oh, I'm like, I don't want to scare you. I do think that there's an element of like, yeah, we should think that. But I think my bigger thing is we are so bad at knowing what's really going to make us happy. Like as humans, we are very, very bad, predictably bad at knowing what will and won't make us happy. And especially at what will and won't produce lasting happiness for us. And the example I always use is like, I think that eating a cookie is going to make me happy in the moment. But really what the cookie is going to do is make my I forget which one it is. There's a chemical in my brain that's telling me that I need the cookie to not be dead. Right. And so (laughs) when I eat the cookie, I feel relieved because I've satisfied that loop, but I don't actually feel happy. I just feel relieved. And so if I have a dream that if I am a full time author, I'm finally going to feel happy and I'll feel secure and feel like I've arrived. And then you listen to Emily talk and think, but that wasn't actually what made me happy right? What made me happy is something other than that. And I would feel relieved when I got that first contract, or I might feel relieved when I was putting books out. But is that actually producing a long-term security in me? No, because our happiness meters have been conflated with our survival meters in our head. And all we're doing when we're most of us, unless you are very actualized, All we're doing is responding to whatever it is our brain thinks is going to finally make us feel okay. We're finally going to feel the relief of all that rush of chemical if we will just do this thing. But then the thing itself doesn't actually make us happy. It just makes us relieved. And so I just want so many of us to think about the fact that there are things that produce happiness in us and security and peace long term, but they are almost always things like relationships and the satisfaction of building something for yourself that you actually want to live in and the pride that you have of having done a good job of something. And you can do that whether you do it full time or not, whether you do it forever, whether you do it, you know, at the Taylor Swift level, 
or at the, you know, whatever entry level. But the goal is to be able to have that level of peace and security. And again, I'm going to return to the emotional regulation thing. If you have not listened to Sarah Baldwin talk about nervous system regulation, and I always encourage people to go to the Mark Groves podcast and listen to Sarah Baldwin. I think it's episode 324. And listen to them talk about the threat detectors and the emotional regulation and stuff like that. It's the best description that I've heard of the things that are causing us to think this way that we don't even realize are causing us to think this way. And I really believe long term that those of us who can regulate and know how to tell garbage information from not garbage information and know how to make ourselves actually lastingly happy and not just relieved because we're not scared anymore. I think that's going to be the key for us to having really secure lives, especially over the next decade and all the changes, both good and bad, right? There are going to be good and great changes, amazing changes, because I actually think the fact that we're in the golden age of publishing is amazing and wonderful and good because I like good quality books being produced. And also, there are going to be negative changes, maybe not for every single one of us, but there will be both good and bad. So remembering to return to this emotional regulation skill, because then no matter what happens, you are going to be okay. Whether success of your wildest dreams happens or whether it doesn't, you're going to be okay still. So again, like I said before, you may not listen to me now. I'm okay with that. But bookmark this podcast or go listen to the Sarah Baldwin talk. And then in the future, come back to this and just remember, like, it's going to be okay. No matter what happens, you can be an author for your entire life, no matter what happens, success or fail, up or down, whatever. You can be an author for your life because you get to choose whether you publish your next book or not. Well, that would be a fantastic place to stop, but I do have something I want to tack on and <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. That like one of the amazing benefits, and I say amazing unironically, of being in this industry for so long and being so relatively unsuccessful. <laughs> one of the benefits of being relatively unsuccessful is I have really had to, with every story, come to a place where I'm like, I have to just love the shit out of this day of writing. Like I have to find joy in this moment of writing, knowing that the book could fail, the book could flop, nothing could come of it. But this moment at the computer, creating something, building this world, creating these characters, getting their dynamic on page. This is a moment of like being in the zone, being in the flow without being religious, because I'm not like a super religious person. But I feel like when I'm writing and in the flow, I'm like the closest I get to being you know, like one with the creator or the universe or whatever. Yeah. At and like, peace. yeah, at peace, exactly. Digging deep so that you find the way to enjoy those moments of creation, no matter what the outcome is going to be, right? Because there are no guarantees for what the outcome is, right? Like, that's just what it is. And so you've got to enjoy the moments. And I guess this comes right back to the building the house you want to live in, right? Is is there enough of peace in the house you want to live in that you're building? Are you doing that, laying that groundwork so that you want to keep living there forever and ever? Yeah, it's amazing. I think in the way that we talk about joy a lot, we get joy and happiness conflated with each other. But joy is actually the state of joy is actually a peace state. Joy as an experience is nothing else is required of you in this moment. Like you are at peace. Everything that can be done has been done. Everything that you can experience has been experienced in terms of like, you're free to feel happiness. You're free to feel content or whatever it is, right? But the peace lasts. Happiness doesn't last. Happiness is a cookie or a sunset or a book release day, right? Or, you know, sex or something like that. Like happiness is fleeting, it's impermanent. But joy that that peaceful state of nothing else is required of me is essentially what emotional regulation can produce. And however you can capture that sense of like, 
nothing else is required of me except to be me in this moment and to be present in this moment. And I am okay. Like that's the thing that we need to be seeking, not, you know, pretty lipstick or like I'm wearing these pretty glasses, right? Because I always do this, like I try to wear something that when I look at it, it makes me smile so I can enter the positive emotion cycle and like find security, right? But that is still just happiness. That's still just one of the four positive emotions on the way to the security that's at the end of the positive emotion cycle. And when you get all the way through from happiness to gratitude to hopefulness to security, that security of the nothing else is required of me in this moment. I am perfect as I am. That peace is what we are all seeking. Like it's what we all really want. And so many of us are resting at just getting happy, 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 happy all the time. Like we keep seeking happiness, but it's not producing the full flow of the positive emotion cycle. And we need to be more focused on, am I feeling all the way through? Is that happiness producing that flow state or that peace state or that security state? Because for me, that's what emotional regulation is all about. It's that nothing else is required of me moment. And that, I mean, I can just feel the relief of like all of the expectations and striving and peace and pause that can happen in those moments when we know we are exactly where we should be doing exactly what we should be doing, feeling exactly how we should be. Nothing more is required of us. Like if we could feel that more often, the creativity in that moment in a peace moment is so significant. I just, I want all of us, because I feel like that's what Taylor achieved when she took that pause back, that pull back, is she achieved that state of, I am who I am, I am where I am, I am what I am, and I have a lot of capacity for excellence, but I'm not succeeding because I'm afraid not to succeed anymore. I'm not succeeding because I'm afraid to fail. I'm succeeding because I can if I want to, and that that level of success is what I aspire toward, I guess is nothing else is required of me except to be me. Love it. (laughs) Me too. So deep. Goals. Deep thoughts. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Now let's wrap it up for real. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Why don't you let us know where people can find you? So the easiest place is betterfasteracademy.com or to search for the QuitCast, Q-U-I-T-C-A-S-T on YouTube. That's where all of our videos are. And then betterfasteracademy.com is where kind of all the information about me is. So, yeah. Yeah, Perfect. And our very last question that we ask everybody is, what is your favorite Taylor Swift song right now? Oh, I'm such a fan of the really old stuff, right? Like I still am like a love story fan. And I have this moment where I used to do children's theater, right? Like I worked at a kid's theater for many years and was a music director. And we used to do these camps in the summer where we would do choreography and they would learn how to sing a song. And I have this very vivid picture of doing Love Story and with this group of kids and just being like, this is that free moment, right? That just like where you're so caught up in such a positive, peaceful, wonderful experience, and you're doing something and producing something together. That's really cool. And I just remember being so in awe of her songwriting and just the experience of producing that with this group of kids. It was just such a great. So every time I think about that, I get a little like, Oh, nostalgia hit, right? So but I'm an old Taylor fan. Like I love her early music. What about you right now, Emily? I've been listening to Long Story Short Ha! from, gosh, what is that? Is that from Lover? No, it's off a re-record. Oh, not even a re-record. It's one of the newer ones. Evermore. Oh, okay. Yeah. I love that song. I think the imagery in it is great. The message is great. It's fun and upbeat. I love it. Mine is would have, could have, should have. Purely because talking about topics in this podcast about how people relate to Taylor in different ways and see different pieces of themselves. This song is how Emily and I formed our connection and 
this podcast came to be so having that discussion I was like it's that one that's stuck in my head now I love that but yeah thank you so much for joining us on the podcast yes thank you yeah thank you for having me amazing thank you for sticking around for so long (laughs) yes it's so long I don't think we're gonna want to book on this one (laughs) yeah yeah I agree that is us for this week thank you so much for tuning in as always hit us up for what you're listening to and loving right now we'll uh see you later